The Palace of the Man in Blue. One day, a group of people who had been travelling together through a certain country came upon a magnificent palace by the roadside. They stopped to admire it, and a steward came out and said, "My master, the owner of this palace, invites you to pass a little time here. There are refreshments and diversions if you would care to consider yourselves our guests." The travellers delightedly followed the man into the courtyard. Just within was a crowd of people, all watching a man in blue robes. One by one, he touched the people, all of whom seemed to be ill. One by one, they changed. The lame walked, the pale looked healthy again, the bent straightened. One of the visitors said to his fellows, "But this is the strangest thing that I have ever seen." This man is a healer, and yet in my own town I have seen him going from one doctor to another, seeking a cure for various ailments of his own. Within a few minutes, the man had finished treating his patients. He dismissed them, and led the guests to a banqueting hall where every kind of delicious food was waiting for them. As soon as they had sat down to eat, one of the company said to his neighbours. This is the strangest thing that I have ever seen. This man gives banquets, and yet in my own town I have seen him begging scraps of bread from door to door. When the meal was finished, the host took them to see his gardens, which covered an immense extent of land. There, amid every conceivable variety of fruit and flowers, an army of gardeners were at work. Swarming like ants through the grounds. When the man in blue was out of earshot, yet another of his guests said to the others, "This is the strangest thing that I have ever seen. Here is a man who must employ more than five hundred gardeners, and yet in my own locality I have seen him desperately seeking work for himself, and often unable to find it." Minute by minute, the wonderment of the visitors increased. It was not diminished when yet another of them said, "This man is well known in my own area. There he is a beggar, piteously stretching out his hand for the smallest coin. Yet here he must be spending more money in a day than a king does in a year." And strange though it may seem, each and every one of those people had seen the man in blue at some time or another, in circumstances of want and suffering. When they had spent several hours in mingled enjoyment and perplexity, their host said to his steward, "I shall retire now to rest. Please escort our friends back to the highway and satisfy any curiosity that they might have. There may be some detail about which we have neglected to inform them. It would be against the laws of hospitality to allow them to leave us without fulfilling their desires." The steward took the people to the gate of the palace, and they crowded around, all talking at once. One was asking about the healing, another about the food, a third about the poverty, a fourth about the expenditure of their strange host. The steward said, "I have one thing to say which will answer all your questions, for your questions are really all one single question." Though they seem to you to be different ones, here is your answer. My master, through his own self, has in the past given each and every one of you an opportunity to help him. But when a needy man asks for help and you help him, you help yourself. Thus is the way for man to do good kept open all the time, among all communities, in every possible manner. The steward turned and walked into the palace. As he did so, like a mirage, every vestige of it melted away. No gnat stings from malice. Proverb. The man who wanted knowledge. A man once said to himself, "What is the use of carrying out the observances of the order to which I am attached, of respecting the adepts, of making donations, 
and of reading all those books. A stranger who was passing by stopped and, as if he read his mind, said, To each outward activity there is an inward activity. To each inward action there is an equivalent in a far distant land. But, said the man, supposing people stopped following the observances of the path. As if in a dream, he heard the dervish say, This is what would happen if there were no Sufi teachers. He saw that, for an instant, the water in the irrigation channels near him had dried up. And this is what would happen if there were no followers. Every piece of greenery in the countryside seemed to have turned brown and withered, and in a few seconds, before their eyes. And this is what would happen if the right passages in the books were not being read. Dead birds began to fall from the skies like hailstones. And this is what would happen if enough sincere people did not respect the adepts. The very earth started to tremble and appeared as if it was about to liquefy. Enough, cried the man. I will obey, read, donate, go to meetings. Alas, said the dervish, as the water, the leaves and the land returned to their normal state. Alas, you cannot now benefit through any of these promises. But why, said the man, for I am humbled. Because you attach yourself to a teaching only through anxiety or desire. It is from such as you that the teaching itself must detach itself. But I only wanted knowledge, said the man. And you got what you wanted, said the dervish, something useless to you and to us. No problem is too difficult to be solved by a theoretician. Proverb. The Mantle Once upon a time, a traveller was shipwrecked on a remote and unvisited island. He was dragged out of the sea half-drowned and looked after by the kindly inhabitants who nursed him back to health. After a time, this man began to notice something quite unusual in the local people. They had, compared to him, very short memories indeed. This made it difficult for them to store up, compare and communicate experience to one another. As a result, each generation had to learn anew, and in many cases each person had to experience the same thing again and again before he could profit by experience at all. The traveller also noticed that if he wore the mantle which had been wrapped around him when he arrived, this served to maintain his own memory, otherwise it became weaker and weaker. He realised that the garment in some way counteracted the local climate which was responsible for causing amnesia and maintaining it. So this mantle became, as it were, the stranger's robe of distinction. People respected him mainly because of his memory. He started to manufacture these robes and tried to get the people to wear them. It was, however, against their customs, and many were opposed to wearing them because they associated them with the great power and superiority of their visitor. He was, however, able to induce some people to wear the robes. They, providing that they made the often forgotten effort to remember, found themselves now endowed with memories. The majority of the people continued to wear no robe, or else to affect them without making the necessary efforts, and in time all that was effectively left of the knowledge and its application was the phrase, in the language of that people, to assume the mantle, or to be invested with a robe, denoting distinction and authority. Like all people everywhere, the people had confused distinction and authority, elegance and prestige, with that which underlies it, capacity. That island is still there. So are its people. The traveller has passed on his way. The robes continue to perform the decorative, ritualistic and emotion-arousing functions 
which the people now regard as appropriate to them. Sleeping is to hunters as excitement is to students. Proverb Unwritten History Ibrahim Yakubov had a small shop. He was not a popular man because he did not spend time with other people and nobody knew very much about him. Nobody knew what he did in his house and everyone wanted to know. Nobody knew what he thought and felt about the things which interested them. All the other people in his town spent their time talking about what they thought and felt. When Yakubov died, they found in his house a beautiful carpet which he had been weaving. He couldn't have made this, for that man had no soul, said the people. Then, one day, a man with a soul appeared, and everyone fell under his spell. And in the end he destroyed them, just because they had decided that those whom they called people with souls were good, and that others were bad. If you cannot lie down, you will stand up once too often. Proverb The Legend of the Cattleman There was once a cattleman who travelled far from his homeland in order to earn his living and also to share his special skill and knowledge with the cattle raisers of other lands. When he arrived in the country where he had decided to settle, he gave himself out as a cattle expert. At first, people crowded around him, anxious to learn his knowledge. They said, We welcome you, for we are specialists in cows and oxen, and we need such as you, although this is not a good country for raising such animals, as they become sick and die very frequently, in spite of all our science. He asked them, And how do you feed and treat your animals? They described their methods to him, and he at once saw that because of deep but false imaginings about the nature and treatment of cattle, they were already preventing their own herds from multiplying and even from flourishing. To them, their own feelings were more necessary than the proper raising of cattle, though they imagined that they were serving their herds. When he tried to point this out to them, they displayed such horror and dismay that he was compelled to say, I am only jesting. Of course you are right in the way in which you treat your animals. Because he had said that, the people allowed him to work with their animals. They appointed him in the end to be their main administrator of cattle. This meant that this man had employment in the country of his choice. But when it came to the matter of being able to carry out his principal ability, that of tending and treating cattle, his condition was one of great anxiety and trouble for him. Because he was compelled by local requirements to treat the cattle with famous but useless remedies when they were sick, he had to spend one third of his nights, which he could have rested, in making the rounds of the herds and administering the right curatives to them. Because he had to feed the cattle with insufficient nutrients, since these were the ones which the local people considered right, he had to spend another third of his free time in secretly feeding to the cattle what they really needed. Only one third of the necessary allotment of rest ever remained to him. His life was shortened by this way of living, but he attained high repute among the cattle people, who regarded him as a paragon of the virtues in cattle wisdom, which was enshrined in their own previous history and aspirations. The cattle herds improved and flourished. When he died and the puzzled cattle people tried to redouble what they imagined to be the correct formulas for dealing with their herds, the animals died even more than they had done before they had ever known the newcomer. It was only because he left a son sworn to secrecy who eventually took his father's place, that the people's welfare, and that of their cows and oxen, was, in spite of themselves, maintained. The best player of a game is the watcher, 
Ask him. Proverb. The Handicap A Persian carpet weaver challenged a Turkish weaving master to a contest. Each was to make the best carpet that he could, so that a panel of judges might finally decide who was the greatest weaver in the world. But the Turk was a philosopher whose teaching for many years had been summed up in this phrase, Never refuse, but never contend. So he accepted the challenge, saying only, I must make one proviso, because of the known disparity between your work and mine. Yes, indeed, said the Persian, I am prepared to agree to a handicap. Very well, said the Turkish master. The condition shall be that I give you a start of twelve thousand years. Be a tiger, if you are ready for a tiger's problems. Proverb.